chatting now with uh, Dr. Tuan Le with the Oklahoma Blood Institute. Uh, sir, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me, Dave. During this time of uh, self-quarantine, stay at home, shelter at home, is it safe to donate? Uh, and thank you, Dave, for, for asking that question. And I just want to reiterate, right, that yes, it is safe to donate, although blood uh, collection organization like the uh, Oklahoma Blood Institute is a critical part of the healthcare uh, infrastructure in this country. We are not uh, a healthcare facility, so therefore we do not treat patients who are uh, ill, let alone right uh, those folks who are unfortunate enough who are now hospitalized because of COVID-19. And so it's a safe uh, process. It's a safe facility for people to show up and donate. And obviously, with all of the talk about shelter in place, be safe at home, stay at home, that sort of thing, that that we need to counter that message with the fact that there are ongoing blood drives sort of being canceled and, and we just need you know, those who are interested uh, to donate to kind of check us out, uh, check us out on uh, our webpage, call us, uh, and then we can uh, have your questions answered. Knowing, right, it, it's an interesting theme, isn't it, Dave, where we know that blood is not only needed daily, but it also is needed continually throughout the year. Uh, and so it is a question that we have to uh, talk about, uh, think about as this COVID-19 uh, pandemic is going on. And that website he mentioned, obi.org, for more information and, and different ways. And let me ask you that. Let's say a person wants to help, but perhaps not donate blood. Are there other ways that people can help out? Yes, that's right. You know, that's a great question because we um, we, we know that if, uh, for example, they're defrauded because of a medication or something, you know, uh, we always need blood donors and, and new blood donors. And, 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 and so therefore, they can help uh, ask their friend, ask their family members who are healthy and all that to come and donate just to get the wound out. It, it was a sad fact, right? If you, don't, uh, you, you may uh, not be aware of this, but of the people in this country who are eligible to donate, it's estimated that less than 10% actually come to a center or at a blood drive to donate. So while there are lots and lots of people who are eligible, uh, they could be so busy and they've never been asked or never thought about it. Uh, but those are the questions that we need people to think about. Uh, and that in case there a specific donor can't donate for some specific reason, that he or she can help recruit a friend and tell uh, their friends and family to come donate for us. Um, is there a blood shortage right now? Dave, you know, holistically to say, we always have a blood shortage, right? Because uh, blood is a needed uh, component for patient care. And they are currently right now, there is no FDA approved blood substitute. So if you want to ask me holistically, right, there is always a blood shortage. But the key of it is, is to manage the blood supply smartly enough to make sure that there is enough blood uh, for the right patient at the right time. It's a blunt question right off the top, just given all the things going on right now that we see nationally and locally. So uh, thanks for that answer. Um, how do you manage it? This is, this is something that the Oklahoma Blood Institute's right in your wheelhouse. You know what to do. Tell us more. How do you manage that? Yeah, so Dave, you know, uh, we have a great team because as you can imagine, right, it takes a village uh, right at the beginning of the recruitment because uh, we are challenged, right, by the fact that there is a message of uh, quarantining and social distancing, uh, which we all support. And at the same time, reminding our dedicated blood donors that uh, blood collection efforts and how we obtain blood is a necessary part of the healthcare infrastructure. And so basically the collection of blood and blood donors are part of that equation of being part of the critical healthcare infrastructure in this country. And so you mentioned about managing the blood supply. It starts right there with our donors. And obviously, we cannot uh, do this without our donor. And so the key message is for our donor uh, is in this time of a pandemic and there could be undue fear, we want to reassure them that the Oklahoma Blood Institute um, is not a healthcare facility. Uh, it is indeed a safe place for you to go and donate blood if you uh, have it on your schedule. Um, and not only that, right, we are thinking of spring break going into the summer where traditionally that's when the blood supply is at its, uh, is at its shortest. And so we want to encourage people who may be busy right now but should think of us 
as the summer goes on as well. Uh, and so right there's the key is that in terms of our blood supply, uh, we are thankful and we depend on our donors to continue donating. Uh, in terms of our inventory management, we have a great team of managing these products. Uh, it's not only talking about red cells, but there's also a specialized blood product called platelets that is short lived. It's only good. Uh, it's only good for five days. So it, it has a short uh, shelf life, if you will, uh, as well as plasma. Uh, and, and so there's a variety of inventory management staff that expertly uh, do this, handle it in terms of from the collection point all the way to the manufacturing of blood. And then we have a dedicated team of distribution folks uh, uh, that uh, make sure that the hospital that need the blood, that uh, it is available for them for patients in need. Are there any local stories uh, that you're hearing of needs, concerns, are there mask shortages uh, in, in Oklahoma or, or any stories you could share with us? Uh, yeah, you know, I can share, uh, the, and I'm, I'm glad you asked me about the mask topic, uh, because I know we've been fielding a lot of questions about that to say, hey, uh, you know, what is the role of masks? Should the public wear a mask? That sort of thing. Uh, and Dave, I just want to reiterate to folks that, you know, according to the current CDC guidelines, along with what the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General, right, uh, Dr. Adams have already advocated earlier this month, these masks should be reserved for uh, our frontline folks, the nurses, the doctors, the respiratory therapists, the ICU staff, the emergency room team, the people who are actually treating patients uh, for other symptoms, you know, besides COVID-19, right? And, 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 and so that's the thing I want to stress is that these masks uh, should only be reserved for the healthcare workers who are on the front line. Um, and just to share with you any kind of story, you know, at the Oklahoma, Oklahoma Blood Institute, we actually have a team of nurses that provide what's called therapeutic apheresis. It's a specialized procedure that is done at the hospital. Uh, and our nurses uh, would uh, provide the service throughout not only Oklahoma City, but also Tulsa as well. And so we actually have experience in terms of, of our own staff, making sure that they have uh, enough protective equipment and the mask. So that way, when they go into the ICU setting, that they're also adequately, uh, adequately uh, protected. And, you know, uh, that, that's a, one thing that I can share is that I am so proud of our team and especially our nurses uh, who are providing these kind of therapeutic procedure. It's unrelated to COVID, of course, right? But these are specialized procedures that's performed uh, in the hospital. Uh, but they, too, are also seeing some of all of these downstream effects of COVID-19 in terms of having enough masks. Uh, Chatting with Dr. Tuan Lei, uh, Chief Medical Officer at uh, Oklahoma Blood Institute. Uh, sir, so in your medical opinion, uh, the stay in place, keep your hands washed, avoid contact with people, the social distancing, is that the best practice? You know, from what the cities have Learned, right? Because we learn a lot of lessons from seasonal, the seasonal flu, uh, the, the, don't we? Uh, and so those common practices of ensuring um, a good hand hygiene, uh, ensuring social distancing, and if you're sick, stay at home uh, and seek medical advice and attention. Uh, those are all good advice, and these are the current advice of uh, the CDC as well. I think we'll all get a little bit cabin fever sometimes. Hey, I want to get back to work. I want to get back to my regular life. But I, I guess in, in your medical opinion, is it better to, hey, stay safe. It, it's good right now. Let this get under control a little bit before getting back into the routine. You know, David, I don't have a very good um, answer for that because obviously, you, you know, you have to look at the risk as a family member, as a as a a dad and mom, and obviously, too, in the setting of kids going to school, right? But I, I, I forgot, and I apologize. Uh, I don't uh, recall where I read this, but I just read this recently where, you know, this theme of social distancing is good, right, in terms of containing the passage and the infectivity of this virus. But at the same time, the key has to be stressed that social distancing does not mean social disengagement. Um, and I think... That's right. And, and this psychologist, and again, I, I forgot why I read it, Dave, but uh, she mentioned this. You know, you can practice social distancing, but why not draw a chalk, right? A circle of uh, 
what, six feet or something, and then stay outside in that circle and talk to your neighbors, right? You know, do your gardening, walk the dog, but either visually or physically, draw that talk, but still talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, right? And, and so we, we get this message of, oh, you, you got to be on lockdown, if you will, stay at home. But, but I think that social distancing needs to be interpreted because it's nuanced. And, and I really like that visual of draw that chalk line, stay socially engaged. And again, my plug, right, Dave, is that what a better way to stay socially engaged than to go to a blood center like ours, go to the fixed site, go to the mobile site, and donate for patients in need. Dr. Lei, why do you do what you do? Uh, you know, I it is a job that I love, and I get to be surrounded by people uh, that are dedicated to the mission. We're a nonprofit, but we know that what we do, we touch lives, right? Because our mission is to be really uh, the, 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 the provider of that life-saving blood to, from the donor who is giving that blood to a patient who is in need. And so it's such positive life affirming uh, to be uh, and to be privileged to be in a job like this. And not only that, I, I get to go to work and work with dedicated professionals who are so dedicated with the, the same mission. Fantastic. We'll leave it right there. He's the Chief Medical Officer with the Oklahoma Blood Institute, Dr. Tuan Lei. Again, more information can be found at obi.org, and they still have need for blood donations. So uh, seek some more information from that website. Dr. I've enjoyed this conversation. I do appreciate your time. Uh, let's chat again. And hey, next time, that bolo tie, right? <laughs> right. Right. Thank, right. Thank, Thank you very, very much, Dave. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. <laughs>